All right, we will just give maybe 30 seconds or so for people to just uh, join in and get settled. Uh, and this is going to be a special evening. So um, we'll just give a few seconds more for people to join in. All right, so uh, good evening and welcome to the Future of Cardiology uh, series. And uh, today uh, is a day where we're going to have a spotlight on advanced heart failure uh, with uh, interesting uh, discussions that will subsequently come on the field of mechanical circulatory failure and where it's leading to. Uh, and to get started before, uh, as usual, I'm going to share the screen to present uh, today's opportunity in terms of CME requests. As you would know that uh, Cardiology Grand Rounds resides uh, on a web page where you can have all the previous videos uh, that can be visited. And uh, you're able to claim your CME credits by visiting these videos 12 hours after they have concluded. Uh, so immediately from now onwards, anytime please feel free to go on this number, 888-816-4893 and text 12450, 12450. And you can do that for 12 hours after the conclusion of the session. It should be an SMS message with your profile being actively reflected in the Rutgers Cloud CME and your mobile number from where you will be texting should be the same one as is registered on the cloud website. In addition to this, uh, as we know that uh, we are providing maintenance of certification points for physicians. For that, you'll have to complete the step one so that you get your CME credits. And after that, you have a link and this link will be displayed also in the chat box and subsequently. And you can visit that to answer a question. The room code is future08. Future 08. And once you link into that and answer the question correctly, your credit for maintenance of certification point goes directly into your ABIM. And for this, you need to have your date of birth and ABM ID mentioned in your cloud CME profile. Very good. So, with that, uh, I'm going to now go ahead and introduce our esteemed guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Mandeep Mehra. Dr. Mehra is uh, a well-known figure in the field of cardiology. He's a uh, William Harvey Distinguished Chair in Advanced Cardiovascular Medicine and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's the Executive Director of the Center for Advanced Heart Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. He was also the founding medical director for the Heart and Vascular Center at Brigham, and in the past has contributed enormously to the field of uh, heart and failure, heart, heart, heart failure and uh, mechanical circulatory support. Uh, and as an editor in chief uh, for the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation, which is now ranked number one uh, for the last 10 years, uh, he has overseen the growth of the field. He is one of the rare person who has been appointed uh, not only as a leader for Distinguished Journal, but also as the president at the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant and president of the Heart and Heart Failure Society of America. And he has uh, uh, himself authored to over 500 scholarly papers with specific focus on advanced heart failure. Uh, he has uh, contributed uh, to a uh, focus uh, on the novel left ventricular assist device engineered to reduce the burden of adverse uh, effects. Uh, and his work has been um, recognized in the New England Journal of Medicine and has resulted in introduction of novel therapies. Uh, in addition to his uh, distinguished career, he's also uh, equally distinguished as a leader he has uh, done his uh, certification for executive leadership from Harvard Business School. 
and completed a Master of Science in Health and Economics and Management at the London School of Economics in 2018. Actually, that was the year when I had the pleasure of inviting him uh, at WVU, uh, West Virginia University Heart and Vascular Institute. And he did mention to me about his uh, specific uh, assignments he was following uh, on his uh, leadership activities. So um, Mandeep, welcome. And it's once again, such an honor and pleasure to have you. Uh, Mandeep, I met Mandeep actually um, five years back at a meeting in India. And subsequently he has been a wonderful friend. Uh, and uh, from time to time, I keep on dialing him and buzzing him. And in fact, I need to thank him because he was uh, uh, one of the most important persons who guided me when I was choosing my uh, leadership opportunity at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And he did was, uh, and he did alert to me uh, the expansive nature of the opportunity. So I want to thank him for that and making this happen and uh, really delighted that you're here. Partho, thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful and delightful um, uh, introduction. Thank you for that. But th more importantly, uh, thank you for being you. Um, I, I hope that everyone um, in the institution recognizes how fortunate they are to have you as their leader now. And um, uh, someone of your caliber, a frontline leader, is um, is iconically what we all desire in today's day and age. And um, you uh, are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Sen Gupta in this leadership role. So um, now that you recognize that this is a mutual admiration society, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, and let me see if... Um, you can see my slide set, which you should be able to see now. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Uh, so I'll, I'd like to spend the next uh, 45 minutes or so in engaging you in a conversation about where the field of um, mechanical circulatory support, and the focus is going to be on durable mechanical circulatory support, uh, where it's going at this time point, what its key challenges are, and how we can circumnavigate this uh, towards success for our patients. Now, it is no secret that the life cycle of device innovation is very, very similar to the way in which we see most technologies. And of course, the most vivid technology we have is cars. And over time, you see disruptive changes in that technology. And we, we are seeing another disruptive change in cars where there's a transition, albeit slow, from internal combustion engines to uh, now to electric vehicles and the complete abolishment of such uh, engines. And such uh, device innovations have occurred in um, a, a similar way with mechanical circulatory support. But it is no secret that devices are engineered, they're clinically introduced and tested, and then they reach a point of obsolescence. And this has been the case with durable mechanical circulatory support, where the field really began in, the, in earnest in the 1990s uh, with the introduction of these very large, bulky devices that turned out not to be so durable. And this was because we were somehow misled into thinking that we needed to mimic the biology of the left ventricle, the way it uh, undergoes um, systole and diastole. And we realized that the price we paid for that was durability loss. And it is now clear that these devices have become much smaller and smaller with fewer and fewer moving parts. And now with the use of space uh, technology inspiration, the 2000s really introduced a disruptive technology in the form of continuous uh, flow devices, which did not necessarily rely on pulsatility and that reduced their size as well as the number of moving parts. And shown here are two devices which, um, which have now pretty much reached obsolescence. One device on the right, the HVAD device has been uh, stopped from commercialization in, on June 3rd of this uh, year. And the other device, the HeartMate 2, has largely been replaced by an upgraded uh, device, the HeartMate 3 pump that we'll discuss in a few moments. 
It is also no secret that the road to uh, innovation in left ventricular assist devices is long and winding. And shown here is a figure from a wonderful perspective piece uh, written by Joseph Stelic and Jim Kirkland in circulation around the time um, of the withdrawal of the HVAD hardware pump from the market. And what's really evident from this slide is the fact that many devices are uh, produced and engineered, but very few actually reach the stage of approval and commercialization, uh, such as the top three devices, and then uh, many reach the point of obsolescence. So this is a tough field. It's not easy. It's no different than uh, drugs, in a sense, because uh, only one in 10 drugs that actually are created uh, will reach the point of true utility in the clinical uh, realm. Um, but it's tough for devices because the production of such devices has largely been due to smaller companies that have really put their entire wherewithal in the engineering components. And then only if they do reach commercialization, they have really been pulled um, into, um, uh, into the field by larger companies. The, the reason why it is really, really difficult to produce a viable, commercially viable left ventricular assist device is the Achilles heel of what is known as hemocompatibility. This is a unique term. It's a, a term that really talks about the relationship between the native biology and the device. So it's the harmonious relationship between the two. This is very different a term from biocompatibility. Biocompatibility by nature implies that there is similar um, uh, attributes of the device to the human uh, body um, and its materials. Uh, so that there is in fact biology that is consistent between the two. In this case, hemocompatibility is a relationship, it's a marriage between the two rather than true um, biological synergy. And we do know that the three components of uh, this Achilles heel uh, that we have uh, been uh, able to um, tackle clinically include pump thrombosis, strokes or neurologic events, and then gastrointestinal bleeding. Now, pump thrombosis has been a major issue with some devices, um, the continuous flow devices in particular. Uh, the heart, uh, hardware device was less prone to de novo pump thrombosis, but it was not an inconsequential number, even with that device. It was the HeartMate 2 that had a fairly high incidence of um, uh, pump thrombosis, which led to uh, the need for a better device. The hardware uh, device, uh, which uh, has now uh, been removed from commercialization, was particularly problematic from a neurologic event and stroke uh, standpoint, where it, there was a three times higher rate of neurologic events with that particular device. And all devices um, do have this complication of a Hades syndrome. Hades syndrome was described for critical aortic stenosis where there is the concomitant development of uh, AV malformations in the gut, which can then uh, be predisposed to bleeding or GI bleeding syndromes that are still a problem with uh, current generation devices across the board, largely because of the type of circulation that is imposed. Now the device that is uh, commercially available and is now the only predicate device available at this time point for widespread use is the HeartMate 3 pump. And this uh, pump was specifically engineered uh, to be fully magnetically levitated in terms of its rotor. So it does not require hydrodynamic elevation to uh, achieve its functionality. The rotor can move in air. And this particular device has very wide blood flow passages, eight times more than other previously um, commercialized devices like the HVAD, for instance, which allow it to be associated with a low shear stress. It's frictionless. And, and this particular device has been built with an intrinsic pulse algorithm 
This pulse algorithm, which um, is created by moving the speed of the rotor up and down, is created at a fixed asynchronous pulse rate of about 30 uh, beats uh, per minute, and is really designed to reduce stasis and avert thrombosis. And um, the initial trial with this device was uh, known as the Momentum 3 trial. It's the largest trial in the LVAD field that um, I had the privilege of chairing. And this particular trial has reported each of its sequential outcomes. And the final outcome suggested clear superiority of this device with a marked decrease in hemocompatibility related complications. And there was near elimination of pump thrombosis, halving of stroke rates, and a, a third reduction in uh, bleeding events. However, our biggest risk uh, for improvement, mostly of nuisance value right now, is in bleeding risk reduction uh, with this particular device. We were recently able to analyze over 2,000 of these pumps that were placed in the post-commercialization phase. And we published that data in the European Journal of Heart Failure as well, uh, which showed uh, that not only are we able to achieve the same outcomes that were shown in the primary Momentum 3 pivotal trial phase, but that we are using it in slightly sicker patients and yet showing excellent outcome. And what was remarkable about this data uh, was that the two-year survival in destination therapy patients, which are patients who are not deemed candidates for transplantation, was 80% or similar to that one sees worldwide uh, with transplantation. So there is an equal opportunity for patients, at least in the short run, even when um, they are deemed not to be good candidates for heart transplantation. Now, as we think about how this field is going to evolve into the future, we cannot uh, simply think of this as an engineering issue. Engineering may be important, but there are actually three intertwined challenges that we must keep in mind. The first is, of course, engineering. The second is how we apply these devices clinically. And the third is what's the environment in the health system that allows us to apply these uh, devices uh, and what are the challenges. And each of these three areas bring unique challenges that uh, trouble us in terms of application and propulsion of such technology. With engineering, I would say that the big three issues uh, with these devices as we move forward uh, are the following. The first is the direction of flow. Today, we have devices that move blood transapically from the left ventricle into the ascending aorta, as a result of which they require an outflow graph that provides another roadway for blood uh, propulsion into the aorta, which creates its own uh, problems. The second engineering challenge is to maintain pulsatility in a synchronized manner with the heart and smart circulation, which essentially denotes the use of physiologically sensitive circulatory flow in these devices, which we currently do not have. And the final uh, engineering challenge is a forgettable interface. Right now we have a drive line that comes out of the abdomen and connects to battery sources or to an externally powered AC unit. And, and we need these devices to become completely forgettable. So where is the progress and the future in this? And I'll share with you just a few devices that are in evolution to give you a sense of where the field is going. This is by no means exhaustive. Uh, this is a device called the Torvad pump. It's based on a windmill-like effect. And what's unique about this is that unlike the usual rotor, it actually has two moving pistons that move the blood um, forward. And in so doing, they require very low RPM. So instead of using the five or 6,000 um, uh, RPM speed with the current generation uh, devices, this one uses a speed of only about 100 to 150 RPMs. As a consequence of this, uh, we believe that this uh, sort of a device will um, will be one associated with lower uh, stress uh, to circulating blood elements, as a result of which it will probably reduce bleeding complications um, uh, with the device. 
there may be other challenges. And this device is also created to be synchronous with pulsatility. So we are very uh, encouraged by this particular device, again, very much in preclinical development. To give you a sense of how others are thinking, this looks very much like the current generation devices. The second device is called the core wave device. And the core wave device, instead of having a rotor that circulates uh, to move the blood and suck the blood into the device and propel it out, this has a fishtail like effect where a um, membrane in fact moves like a fish tail and propels blood in a synchronous manner so that it's capable of co-pulsation with the heart and even counter pulsation with the heart as the physiology demands. One challenge with this particular device that we're likely to see is that it's a much larger device than even the HeartMate 3. It's about 50% uh, larger, and therefore its applicability across the spectrum of all profiles may be limited. But again, this is a device uh, just like the Torwad, which is at least about a year and a half to two years away from uh, first in human experiments. Now, I will point out that the biggest challenge that we have with uh, device technology is that the L in LVADS is, is one that supports just the left side, as a result of which we have an unsupported ventricle in these patients. And there's a big challenge. You would think that you know if you uh, decrease the pressure in the left side, you decrease pulmonary artery uh, pressure, that the right ventricle should get better. But we notice quite the reverse. If you look at 3D echo imaging, as you start increasing the speed of the LVAD, uh, the LV becomes much more conical and smaller, whereas the RV becomes larger. Now, why is that? And why is the unsupported ventricle not necessarily getting better in many cases, but is getting worse? Well, there are many reasons for that. Um, uh, and Perhaps one reason is that you're doubling the preload to an already stressed right ventricle. So as you start to flow more blood, uh, the RV is loaded uh, with a greater preload. But that has to be a small uh, reason for this entire uh, observation. The second reason is that the septum, which is shared between the two ventricles, is critical in providing about 40% of the forward flow in the uh, right ventricle. And this is completely made dyssynchronous by the change in the flow, where the buttressing effect of blood flow across the aortic valve is now lost and a mechanical dyssynchrony develops in the septum, as a result of which uh, one actually sees an, a diminished ability of the RV to respond to pulsatile loads um, on, its, um, uh, on its stress configuration. The tricuspid valve becomes uh, dysfunctional as well uh, as a result of a misalignment of the septal component of the tricuspid leaflet. And once you open the pericardium, some of the torsion and the, um, and the compliance related changes that the pericardium is um, ensuring in, a other, in an otherwise normal heart uh, configuration are also lost. So there are a number of reasons beyond um, just uh, increased flow that uh, uncover right ventricular dysfunction. Now, this is an important point to keep in mind because this is in many ways beyond the hemocompatibility related complications, the real Achilles heel of how long-term support is being considered with these devices. And it may be germane to spend just a minute or so to talk about the different kinds of loads on the right ventricle. And while we don't have time to go into the details of this, we generally tend to think of resistive loads like pulmonary vascular resistance or pulmonary diastolic gradient uh, as being the primary loads on the right ventricle. And it turns out that when we look at the correlation of resistive loads with RV failure after an LVAD is placed, they actually don't correlate very well. What really correlates are pulsatile loads. And you can understand that because resistive loads are reduced significantly by left ventricular unloading, but pulsatile loads, which are really generated um, from the RV free wall, as well as septal mechanics 
uh, in terms of uh, adaptation response um, are the ones that are greatly challenged. And in fact, pulmonary arterial compliance um, has been uh, noted as an important uh, construct to think about as we are thinking about right ventricular failure in the setting of left ventricular assist devices. But hemodynamic problems are not the only problems that we see uh, with um, uh, the challenge to the right ventricle. The mere operation itself has to be made less um, intense, I would say, because um, of what happens during the operation when, in terms of RV dilation, the need for transfusions, uh, hepato, renal congestion, um, all of that drives uh, the syndrome of RV dysfunction, in addition to the pre-existing myopathy that is challenged now by the hypo hypoxia and the acidosis and the prolonged bypass time and all of these stresses that are placed on the right ventricle. This is why uh, models where people have tried to predict the occurrence of RV failure post fat implantation have been miserable failures. And even the most recent one by Solomon using a uh, Euromax um, predictive model has not been uh, shown in real world application to be anything better than really a flip of the coin. And it's because of this multivariable approach uh, that, uh, and that exists where it's very difficult to account for dominance of one out of say 10 factors that are playing a role in an individual patient where prediction becomes very, very difficult. And hopefully if we have time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you think about this challenge. Because most of us see the need for temporary RV support, uh, which uh, one has many configurations with. And even some have uh, suggested that if you minimally implant uh, the device from a minimally invasive technique standpoint, by not doing a central sternotomy that there may be some benefit, but frankly, I'm not so sure whether that represents patient selection rather than a true benefit uh, in, uh, in patients. Now, uh, another uh, emerging technology is uh, one would say, you know, do away with the RV, don't worry about it, just do biventricular support. Biventricular support is still challenged. We have not been able to create the best biventricular device for a number of reasons. It turns out that the cardiorenal axis is very much dependent on production of natriuretic peptides. And if you excise the two ventricles in order to place a uh, prosthetic heart, um, you may actually see reduction in renal function and renal flow uh, abruptly uh, initially, which then settles over time. But certainly it's not an easy operation uh, to just excise the ventricle. There is a homeostasis collateral loss that occurs as a result of that. Uh, these are two devices, uh, one known as the CARMAT device on the right, it's a very interesting device from which we will learn about technology in the future, but I'm not sure that this device itself will be the panacea that we are looking for for a number of reasons. It's very large, so it's only applicable for implantation in larger uh, humans, um, few women, mostly men. Um, it actually has uh, two features that I'm very attracted to. One is a, a true biocompatible surface that could do away with the need for long-term anticoagulation. And the second is auto-sensing uh, capability, which allows it to be physiologically sensitive. So we may be able to learn something about this for future generations of device, devices. This may not be the device that provides the panacea. On the other hand, we have a device called the Bivacore uh, device that I find very interesting. It sort of is small, fits in the palm of the hand, and it's a very interesting device that has a continuous flow rotor, but the rotor compartmentalizes the right and left flow by creating phasic dissonance. So it moves from the right to the left and creates a phasic dissonant um, contractile um, function of the RV flow and the LV flow. And it's small enough that it may even be applicable to young children, people with uh, adult congenital heart disease, et cetera. So I would just say, stay tuned for this particular device. Uh, there are some interesting features uh, for application in the future. But maybe, maybe the physiologic flow is what we're looking for. Maybe a, 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 a complete disruption in the field 
would be to change the direction of flow rather than sucking blood out from the apex of the left ventricle is to actually synergistically push blood across the aortic valve. And there is a device now in preclinical development called the ICOMS uh, device uh, that's being uh, manufactured in France at the moment in, and is being tested in animals. And we don't know what the future of this device will be. But certainly I'm very excited about the technology where this may represent trans uh, aortic flow that may allow for a true reduction in right uh, sided uh, dysfunction because it will not create the mechanical dyssynchrony that is created to the septum and may provide enough buttressing of the septum that limits the degree of injury to the uh, right ventricle in terms of flow uh, dynamics. So we'll see where this device goes, but um, I wanted to show you this as a encouragement of where we are moving with the field. There is another group of people who are engineering uh, biomimetic non-blood contacting devices. So these are devices that don't even touch blood and are simply designed to uh, be external to the heart and give some um, um, suitable um, um, assistance. And in order to actually power them, they're using uh, internally powered sources, like even a latissimus dorsi muscle. You know, if you remember, there used to be a concept of cardiomyoplasty in the very, very early old days of um, heart failure management. And that didn't work because people were taking the latissimus dorsi muscle and wrapping it around the heart um, and giving it uh, external non-contacting uh, non contractile support to bolster the heart function. That didn't quite work out because skeletal muscle uh, is not cardiac muscle and it ossifies and calcifies after uh, excess use. But uh, whether you can use uh, this to simply power it from a pump standpoint, don't know. So this is in development as well. And I point this out to you. There's another group of devices that I'm very excited about called CADs. So let's not call them VADs, but let's call them CADs or circulatory assist devices. And what's unique about these devices is that these are devices that attempt to improve flow in the descending aorta uh, in a mechanism to in fact uh, invoke benefits uh, in cardiorenal syndrome. Now, what's advantageous about this is that they may be very good to use acutely, but most of these companies that are producing this, and these are three different iteration of devices, and from left to right, it's the Cardio Bridge, the Procerion, and the second heart assist device uh, that I haven't named here, but these are three very different devices that are in commercialization uh, phases at different levels right now of preclinical and even early clinical um, phase two deployment, uh, where these devices may be applicable also for patients with um, a heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, where the criticality of the hemodynamic perturbation is cardiorenal in terms of uh, the congestion cycle that uh, it pursues with these devices. So I would stay tuned for this uh, device um, construct as well. Now, let's uh, shift uh, gear for a moment uh, to clinical application, which is clearly um, uh, the second con uh, uh, concept. We've talked about engineering principles. Let's move to clinical application. And the first um, area is implantation. What's the timing of referral of patients? What are the surgical issues? And we don't have time to go into all these details, but I'll point out to you a few uh, things to think about. And in the post-implant phase, uh, we have such a poor evidence base for medical therapy once we've implanted these devices that we really need to make inroads into moving the field forward with true evidence-based therapy. Uh, from a pharmacological therapy standpoint. And we need to create consistent and harmonious um, uh, surveillance uh, techniques for detection of complications. So let's uh, try and dissect some of these issues. Now, you should know that uh, the timing of when you refer a patient for uh, left ventricular assist device therapy has to fulfill a pathophysiologic construct. 
And what's that pathophysiologic construct? The simplest way to define that is to think about Laplace therapeutics as being the pathophysiologic construct. And Laplace's law, as you uh, may know and can see from this uh, depiction here, is the relationship of stress, which is directly proportional to pressure and radius of a cavity, and inversely proportional uh, to the thickness of the wall. And certainly, we have tried everything. We've tried to change the, the shape of the heart. That hasn't really worked well surgically. We've tried to use cell therapy, and that's more hype than reality at this phase. So it's only left ventricular assist devices that have remained truly, truly um, uh, life-saving and, and with quality adjusted life-saving that we have seen. Where is its right place? Its right place is when the neurohormonal cytokine and growth factor construct has now shifted to where the dominant perturbation is mechanical stretch and strain. And you can see that clinically with a number of ways. And the way I like to look uh, at this uh, shift from the right to the left in that pathophysiologic construct is my rule of three for timely referral. And I say, let's simplify this academic message for our colleagues to say, this is when you have to send patients to us in advanced heart failure so we can start to think about them. Recurrent hospitalizations, more than two a year hemodynamic intolerance to neurohormonal antagonism, staircase diuretic use with cardiorenal uh, syndrome, and two very unique uh, precarious scenarios, non-responders to CRT and non-candidates for edge-to-edge -edge repair for mitral regurgitation are classic candidates who you should be managing in an advanced heart failure construct uh, whenever you can. So I'll just uh, share with you uh, some uh, evidence of uh, poor adoption of uh, many of these issues in the re real world. This is data from Europe, and this is uh, dubbed as a CHF uh, study. And they found that just in a CRT ICD clinic, about one in 10 patients already had persistent class 3B to class 4 heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So these were not great responders to CRT. And amongst these, more than a quarter of them would have actually and should have been referred to an advanced heart failure center for either heart transplant or left ventricular assist systems and were not. And when these patients were approached to try and understand or the clinicians were approached to try and understand why not, it turns out that many patients were declining um, uh, the offer to be seen at an, heart, at an advanced heart failure center, largely because of uncertainty and lack of understanding, which means that if the clinician is not equipped to have the right way of detailing this to the patient, uh, we are not going to see the patient accepting this. So it also turns out that uh, there's a prevailing mythological thought that, hey, we're making so many strides in medical therapy that uh, advanced therapy will become obsolete. Well, I'll tell you that that's not entirely true. Uh, you may have seen the LIFE trial, which was just published in JAMA Cardiology, which looked at Sacubitril Valsartan or Entresto uh, in advanced patients, and it actually did not uh, meet its endpoint uh, of a uh, reduction in natriuretic peptides. But if you look very carefully at that trial, it did not show any benefit. And in fact, the adverse event rates were much higher, particularly intolerance and hypotension. So one has to be very careful um, with, uh, with, uh, with taking data that has really been created in less sick patients and apply them to these more advanced patients who have really transitioned into Laplace therapeutic needs. We just completed the GUIDE HF trial, which was published in, in Lancet and presented at the ESC. And in this particular trial, where we inserted a cardio MEMS unit and randomized patients and managed their PA pressures, it turns out that NYHA4 patients did not seem to benefit at all, indicating that this particular, there's a group of patients that we think are doing well and may do well with conventional therapy in whom all we're doing is delaying the transition to appropriate referrals. And if you just look out there, people argue that the current ratio of need versus use may actually be 10x. 
And so what we need as a community is we need optimism and we do need the changes in technology as we are moving forward, but we do need to create a coherent dialogue amongst ourselves to understand where the true positioning for these devices is. Because one could say, hey, um, you know, maybe in today's day and age, the survival of inotropic dependent patients has actually changed. And this is data from the rematch trial where you can see that the medical therapy arm by two years, um, almost no one was alive um, except in single digits. But at even today's data, this is a single center study that was uh, looking at patients who received inotropic therapy. Turns out that in such patients, the two-year survival of inotropic therapy bound patients is less than 40%. And if you know that there is a clear doubling, an absolute increase in survival at two years with an LVAD out to 80% for people with destination therapy needs, well, it becomes very difficult then to argue against consideration in such, uh, such patients. This is not, inotropic therapy, for example, is not equivalent therapy uh, in, uh, to an LVAD. Now, a few words about freedom from an external driveline, which still is the Achilles heel. Patients say, you know what, I'd rather just stay on an uh, inotrope and risk uh, a, a halving of survival um, because I just don't want to be bound to this device. Um, and there are efforts uh, that are underway to abolish this and turn this into a forgettable interface. Uh, there is shown on the right coplanar technology that is a bit difficult to implant but gives the most freedom up to about eight hours to patients to move around without uh, being holstered. Um, and uh, the tech systems shown uh, to your left, which are transcutaneous electrical uh, transduction systems uh, that um, certainly are being entertained as forgettable systems, or at least those that don't require the exit of a driveline. The problem with each of these technologies is not really in the system, whether it's TET or coplanar, it's with the battery and the capacitance of the battery. Because today's batteries require a major disruptive shift in uh, if we are to truly move forward to, an, um, uh, to a uh, true forgettable interface. Now, two quick points that I hope to discuss even more health system uh, policies and the environment around us also drives how we use these devices. There's cost effectiveness um, related problems that we uh, notice. People think that these devices are not cost effective. In fact, we just completed an analysis based on a network meta-analysis uh, for um, England and the UK system for the NHS uh, to look at the cost effectiveness. And we actually find that the quality adjusted life years saved uh, with a uh, heart rate three pump, for instance, um, is uh, reaches the cost effectiveness threshold of 50,000 British pounds um, um, for one uh, quality adjusted life year saved in 97% of cases. And this paper will be uh, published very soon in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. So we have gotten closer and closer and may have met the threshold for society's cost effectiveness now for destination therapy. And so we have a life-saving therapy, but yet challenges remain. Transplant policies are another issue. And, and we've just seen the shift in the United States. Uh, in, on, uh, on October 18th, 2018, uh, we changed the allocation system for how hearts are delivered to uh, centers. And it resulted in a draconian shift towards mechanical support that was more temporary than durable. And hopefully in the discussion, we'd love to see what your own program's attitudes are towards that challenge, uh, which has really created quite a disruption where there has been a major shift mostly to destination therapy for durable heart pumps. Now, in the last um, a few minutes, I'd like to just mention uh, for you what I think are key principles in myocardial recovery and remission. And I'd like to frame this for you because we've always considered the holy grail is let's put in these LVADs and the idea will be that we will uh, completely recover these patients. 
And largely it's because we observe this with pharmacological therapy, whether we use ARBs or we use SGLT2 inhibitors or beta blockers or CRT or the mitra clip. Uh, there are a number of patients in whom we will see improvement in LV function. And there are some patients in whom we see what we refer to as super responses. So these are patients who in fact show almost normalization of function. So I'd like to introduce uh, for you the concept of elasticity versus plasticity in understanding this. If you look at this uh, particular woman who is in a fairly complex yoga posture um, and contorted, uh, none of us would argue that uh, she will walk away home uh, with no deformation, right? I mean, we know that she is likely going to come out of this and completely be elastic in, uh, in the way she will come out of this particular posture. So elasticity is like a rubber band, right? You take a rubber band and you pull it and then you let it go and it um, uh, comes back to its original shape uh, nine out of 10 times without uh, deformation. But you take a paper clip, which is more plastic, um, and you take a paper clip and if you deform the paper clip and then you reform it, you may still retain its functionality as a paper clip, but its quality of um, how it looks in terms of whether or not it will be deformed is largely lost. And this is a key challenge um, with the heart because we think that by the time we see these patients who we think might be recoverable, uh, they have already entered into the late plastic region and reached what might be uh, seen as a fracture point here. And it's only those patients who are still in an elastic region where we see true recoverability, peripartum cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, takitsubo cardiomyopathy, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So there are a number of uh, situations in which we see almost total recovery recovery, but uh, most uh, cases, the recovery is not complete. And in fact, we learned this very um, nicely from a small trial called the TRED HF trial published in Lancet and was conducted by John Cleland and Brian Halliday and others uh, from Imperial College. And what is unique about this trial is they, they took patients who had otherwise recovered. So these were HFREF patients who had recovered to a normal EF, they had normal LV size and the anti-pro BNP was uh, uh, being expressed at near normal levels. And they then started taking them off diuretics and then slowly off of neurohormonal therapy. Turns out that nearly half of them relapsed in six months. And in fact, 40% of those who um, 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 relapsed versus those who didn't uh, had late gadolinium enhancement on CMR. And this was really not predictive. Uh, of those who didn't relapse, they had some uh, um, late gadolinium enhancement and those who did relapse um, actually didn't. So it turns out that some predictors of relapse were an older age, uh, who were on more heart failure medications, who had higher global radial strain, higher nitritic peptides, and, but, but even genetic causes, nor LGE on CMR, were predictive. This is a really small study and maybe Dr. Sengupta through his um, visionary leadership in uh, artificial uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence will be able to help us figure out who's the right patient for recovery. But we've seen a glimpse of uh, this elastic plastic issues even with the MITRA clip. So we have two trials, the MITRA FR trial and the COAP trial in patients with moderately severe MR and LV dysfunction. And it turns out that COAP showed a survival benefit and MITRA, MITRA FR did not. And um, what's the difference? The difference is that if you take MITRA FR type patients within COAP and you look at them, you will actually see no difference whatsoever. So these are typically patients whose heart has dilated much greater in proportion to the degree of mitral regurgitation that's residual. So they do have functional MR, but their cardiomyopathic component is now not being driven by the functional MR. It's mostly residual. And that's the key. And how we figure that out, um, again, our colleagues in imaging have to make us smarter. So what we actually observe is that we see a lot of cellular recovery data. We see that uh, structural functional recovery after an LVAD occurs in about 30 to 40% of patients, but true clinical recovery allowing us to explant these devices is not commonly uh, seen. 
And in fact, when you look at our registry databases, this is data from Intermax, very current uh, data, which is, um, um, which is out to 2018 and then followed, followed up, suggests that about 4% of patients can be truly explanted with recovery at four years. So it's very, very low. Now, why is that? Well, one uh, reason that I will propose for you is that the unsupported ventricle, the right ventricle, continues to retain the phenotypic memory, both at the cellular level and at the structural level uh, for heart failure. And when you have half the heart still uh, retaining its phenotypic memory, we're not uh, perfect and you can't expect complete recovery. And in fact, it might be that the people who recover the best are the ones whose right ventricles recover the, the best as well, which may indicate uh, plasticity rather than, uh, or elasticity rather than plasticity. Because some studies that have looked at transcriptomics have suggested that 95% of dysregulated genes uh, in heart failures remain uh, dysregulated even after LVAD support. And it turns out that the extracellular matrix does not revert to normal in these patients either. And it can go in different ways. It can actually get worse. I will draw your attention to a trial called the Restage trial, which uh, was really a great effort done at six centers led by Emma Burks and her colleagues uh, from Louisville. Uh, this was a trial where they enrolled patients, uh, 40 patients were enrolled at six centers over three years. So you can, you can imagine these were large centers. Uh, you know they have many more patients being uh, considered for LVAD over three years than, uh, than were enrolled here. But they structurally looked for evidence of improvement in their structure, their function, and then even did testing to see if they could completely explant the devices. And it turns out and that they were able to do so for about four out of 10 of these patients. Now, you could think, you would say, wow, this is great, 40% uh, uh, improvement in uh, ability to recover these patients. But it turns out that these were largely non-ischemics, less than five years of heart failure, and less than 60 years of age. If you really look at the data very closely, you'll find that the average age of enrolled patients in this trial was in the 30s, and the average uh, duration of heart failure was about a year and a half. So these were young patients, and on a Bayesian probability standpoint, would not be very representative of the kind of patients that we push for LVAD therapy. Yet, I will credit the, this um, uh, effort uh, in terms of its ability to actually show that in selected patients, we should always think about uh, recovery. Well, some people say, well, you know, you're, you're just missing the boat. You can just put in stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells at the time of LVAD and, and the paracrine uh, effects of that or, or its direct effects are such that they will in fact improve outcome. And it turns out they don't. It turns out that in this particular study where they just looked at surrogate outcomes, for LV function improvement, they were unable to show this in a large number of patients. And um, uh, this uh, concept seems to be quite dry. So what's the future in recovery regeneration? Uh, goodness, I really don't know. I don't know because we don't know what's the right age um, and, and whether disease cells are the right um, cells to implant. I don't know whether they should be of a good enough quality. How do we ascertain quality? What cell types? Do we need one? Do we need a mosaic? And uh, just like with heart failure therapy, is it quadruple therapy or is it single therapy? And then what are the long-term adverse events? And maybe uh, this data that um, some of our investigators here on the Longwood campus are attempting to completely decellularize the heart and then recellularize it with, with uh, uh, tolerant uh, cells may be the way to go in the future, but this too is still a pipe dream. And so we need a necessary wedding of clinical and translational perspectives. And there are so many questions which many of us have outlined in some of these reviews that we don't have time to go into the details of, but certainly there we need meticulous planning to think about who is plastic and who is elastic in terms of recovery potential. So we can't always have the cart before the horse and maybe the future in this is massless energy storage. You know, There's an entire um, uh, direction now 
where structural integration of energy sources is being considered. And maybe that's the way uh, of the future to give these uh, heavy demand devices the right battery storage, that is insert the battery into its structural component throughout rather than simply having a separate battery. Maybe that's the way. And maybe the real way is for us to educate ourselves using artificial intelligence and machine learning for which you are very fortunate in having a world-class leader in Dr. Sen Gupta and his team um, to actually deploy uh, your academic energies in helping us solve this uh, puzzle. So let me go ahead and stop here and thank you for your attention. And hopefully this has given you some food for thought uh, and um, uh, we can uh, generate at least what uh, I might consider to be a uh, great discussion at this moment. Thank you very much, Mandeep. Uh, as usual, it's always stimulating and you know you always th make me think and uh, thank you for complimenting, although I know that artificial intelligence stands no chance against nature's best design. Uh, you know, the, I mean, heart has its own reasons of how it's structured and we are still trying to understand the intricacies and your uh, points about the RV function uh, is, is something that has been of interest to me. And um, hopefully if I can talk later on, I'll, I'll try to, but right now I want to bring onto the center stage uh, two very important people for the program here. And Dr. Adipa Iyer, who is the uh, medical director of the VAD program, uh, assistant professor of medicine. And, and uh, I have to compliment Deepa for single-handedly managing the entire program for several years uh, before we have now got renewed energy to make sure that uh, it thrives. Uh, uh, so thank you, Deepa, for joining us. And I also want to bring in uh, Dr. Hiro Iki Ikigami, uh, our transplant uh, cardiac surgeon who together with our team is uh, building up a great reputation of uh, doing some wonderful implantations uh, uh, and, and transplants uh, recently. And, and uh, I think the floor is pretty open and um, maybe Adipa, you wanna summarize the scene here and we, we could be pretty organic to take a discussion and take uh, uh, a phenomenal leader here and in and, and, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mehra's uh, presence to understand and solve some of the scenarios, let's say, if we would like to talk through and, and then we can think through and discuss some more uh, uh, as, you, as we walk through. Thank you, Partho. Thank you, Dr. Mehra. That was an excellent comprehensive review in less than 40 minutes. And you walked us uh, through an entire uh, decades of, you know, bad, um, bad um, uh, inventions and popularity. Um, I remember one of my first lectures, somebody talked about Dr. DeBakey and how he had to testify with Congress back in 16, back in 64, 1964, to initiate the artificial heart program, which is federally funded. And so it's really come a long way since then. So so a um, couple of uh, two questions, um, you know, and I was discussing that with you a little before, you know, we started this talk. Um, as uh, traditionally put, heart transplant continues to be the gold standard in uh, patients who have advanced in stage heart failure. And, um, and we all know that the number of transplants that have occurred over the last 25 years have been uh, pretty much similar in uh, numbers around the 5,000 to 6,000 range, despite increase in donor pool with hep C donors, DCD donors. And, uh, and then you also clearly mentioned the change in the allocation system in 2018 that changed the narrative of many transplant programs. We went from doing 50-50 uh, BTT and destination therapy LVADs to um, you know, changing uh, that ratio. Although in our program, we continue to have 40% of our patients uh, do a bridge to transplant you know, LVAD, especially those with robust RV functions. Um, however, that has definitely uh, been a disadvantage for those patients patients on durable VADs awaiting a transplant. So that's one. And uh, so the question to you is, is it time to change the narrative about heart transplant being the gold standard? And the second question that follows is, is it just a change of perception in the patient or is it just this perception that we have to embrace as a community, knowing like you clearly said, based on the C, you know, heart failure trial and other trials, that there is so many patients out there that require, you know, advanced therapies. Yeah, so it's a great, uh, great comments, Deepa, and a uh, great question. And I'll try to answer it uh, from an analogy that I, I, I always encounter when I go to a restaurant. I think of heart transplantation as the uh, vegan vegetarian um, uh, consumer. Uh, 
So that's the one who goes in, you know, there's a widespread, every restaurant is created. Uh, we have something off the shelf, uh, but, uh, but you start asking for vegan and vegetarian food and a few people cater to it, a few don't. That's essentially what heart transplantation is. It's a life-saving therapy, no doubt, but its scalability is quite low. Right, so that's the big challenge with uh, with heart transplantation. It is a gold standard for those patients in whom uh, they are fortunate to be able to get it. So there's no question about that. I don't think VADs are as good as heart transplantation in the long run, even today. But the reason that they are they 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 do so well in the long run with heart transplants is we hyper-select these patients. You can't have peripheral vascular disease, you can't have diabetes, you can't have this, you can't have that. Um, and so, so the, the real group of patients are the ones who are just looking uh, for, uh, for a solution. And, uh, and, and even, even in Momentum 3, even before the allocation system change, 64% of the patients were DT patients to begin with. Okay, and if you really dissect down the data, um, when we appeal to the US um, uh, payer uh, group, CMS, to actually do away with these artificial terms in the US of BTT and, and DT, which as you're aware, uh, were changed in December of 2020 as a result of our um, uh, push with the, the payers for about two years following Momentum 3, what the reason we were able to succeed is that we were able to prove to them that you should think of it as a single indication right now. You know, LVAD should be thought of as a single indication. And then came the 2018 allocation system, and that just hit us um, like a ton of bricks because everyone somehow believes that, that getting their patient to a heart transplant should be their goal, no matter what healthcare resources you use and no matter how tough it is on the patient or their family. And I think that's wrong. And I'm so glad to hear that your... Uh, your splay is still 40, 60, which is what we saw before the allocation system in Momentum. We're conducting another international trial right now called ARIES with LVADs. And we're seeing actually that most centers are still um, in that mix, but it's shifting a little bit 70, 30. So 30% 30 of the patients entering with an LVAD are BTT patients and about 70% are DT patients. So I do think a shift has occurred. I don't think that uh, uh, heart transplant should be considered a gold standard that you should compare with because it's apples and oranges in my opinion. Do you agree with that Deepa? Uh, you're muted. I do, but at the same time, to your point, you know, like somebody who's 71, who has reasonable LV function. I mean, we recently, there was a patient 71 with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy who had a reasonable RV function, the PAPI was good going in, um, also had a mechanical aortic valve. And, you know, traditionally he would have been at the cusp where you would think about transplant or VAD, but with the momentum data and with, you know, everything, although addition of, and changing the mechanical aortic valve to uh, tissue valve, who, you know, added to his bypass time, uh, I think he, I think we still kind of said that he was not a candidate for, you know, transplant for multiple reasons and went ahead, you know, putting the bad. So I think that as perception, many of us as caregivers in the community do not market that. First of all, there's a patient perception. The first time they look at the machine when my coordinators are doing a consent, they're like, oh my goodness, what am I getting into, right? The driveline continues to be the Achilles heel. I mean, it, uh, you know, all of that. And then to find that the caregivers are ourselves do not promote that I think is something which I find in our in our profession. Yeah, you know, I'll just make one other quick point. Um, and I'll see if Dr. Ikegami also agrees with me. But, but if you just think about it, you know, uh, we'll have all our colleagues uh, talking about how important it is to in institute quadruple therapy. And I, I agree, I mean, you need to give the best medical therapy. But when you actually look at quality adjusted life years gained with all of those therapies, you know, they're significant, but it's about a year and a half for quadruple therapy, right? Um, out to eight years, you gain, gain about a year and a half of survival, not necessarily quality adjusted survival. If you look at true cost effectiveness analysis with an LVAD, with a HeartMate 3, over a five-year horizon, the quality adjusted life years gained is about three, 2.89 is the actual number that we've been able to actually calculate. And we'll be, I mentioned to you that we are publishing this data very shortly in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant. I don't think there's any therapy other than heart transplant and LVADs that gives you that much of gain. And 
yet it's one of the least used therapies, largely because of cost, largely because of perception, largely because people in the community think of it as end stage therapy. They think of it that unless you're near death, you shouldn't use an LVAD. And I don't know what um, Hero uh, thinks about this. I mean, he uh, obviously trained with some of my uh, friends who are at the forefront of this technology, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, so again, this is great technology. And uh, last decades, uh, this has been advanced, improved a lot. And uh, again, thank you for your insight and uh, thank you for your lecture. So just, I just have a small comment um so as you mentioned uh so hopefully this technology keeps advancing it's it, it, it's coming for sure so like you said more like a so right now still we have like a uh infection gi bleeding like some thromboembolic issue stroke so in the future yeah, we need, like you said, we need a, some like a transcutaneous uh, energy system, more like a biocompatible machine, smaller machine, and uh, passatile is better for GI issue. And uh, also like a artificial intelligence, like a smart pump that can adjust the flow based on the, like a bio, the physiological feedback so yeah so again this this technology is very rapidly uh advancing so let's see and uh yeah <laughs> so so i have a i have a um a few questions for this very esteemed um group of people here uh so the number one is the heart failure is growing much faster than we can imagine, right? It's a big problem community. And I would suspect that it's equally both for heart failure preserved, maybe a little bit more of a preserved EF for elder with elder aging population than reduced EF. But nevertheless, the burden is increasing. But we are not training people equally at the same speed and cer certainly not in heart failure. So where are we going to get the next generation of people to implant or our surgeons to do the procedures because um, there is a there is a there is a big problem. So we have more heart failure patients, but not heart failure transplant cardiologists trained. We have and people are going after valvular heart disease just because there's transcatheter therapies that are coming up. But that's not the the main burden of problem in the community. Yeah, I'm sure it is there. So somebody has to do a reality check. And, and I, I want to be provocative here. Um, uh, and, and maybe the first two years of cardiology should be heart failure training and imaging training and no, no, uh, no procedural training. Um, perhaps people are going to be very disappointed if I say that. But unfortunately, uh, if you get trained in heart failure, you can manage anybody. Uh, you, you'll be probably a good uh, structural or cardiologist also. Uh, yeah, you need to get the understanding of the hemodynamics, but you don't need to be invasive for hemodynamics all the time. But it's a provocative comment, but let me see what uh, all of you so, say. So, so as, as usual, you're a visionary, right? So that's why you'll throw out things that uh, completely pull us back and we say, oh, wow, that's an interesting thought, right? So, um, so, 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 so um, uh, let me just react to that. You know, you say something extremely important and, and I'm telling you the challenge is even greater than what you said. So heart failure is growing. We know that atrial fibrillation and heart failure are the two epidemiologically the most greatest things. We know that there's so much excitement in heart failure. Even in HEFPEF now, there's excitement in HEFPEF. There's at least some therapies and then there's amyloidosis and then there's, um, uh, you know, people who can learn sarcoid uh, heart disease. So there's sarcoid, amyloid and, and HEFPEF therapy. So even that is becoming exciting. But yet, uh, Partho, you, you know, what is unbelievable is that a year ago, if you ask Deepa, uh, uh, you know, what was the status of the advanced heart failure fellowship match in the US. 
we actually looked at this data and it was horrible. So 36 out of, I think, 100 positions went unfilled in the United States last year. Now you say, you say we're not, you know, you're, you as the, an academic leader and an administrative leader is saying, I need more heart failure people, right? And, and why are you guys not producing them? And, and we're telling you they're not coming to train. There's a, there's a, there's a real gap right now. And, and they're coming to train at only a few centers. So for example, at the Brigham, we, we have three fellows a year and we've never had a problem matching our one, two and three ranked. Okay, uh, we, you know, I, I put my fingers up uh, to say, hopefully, you know, that was an immodest statement, but we're very fortunate from that standpoint. Um, but when you look at what's happening around the country, it's not the same. And so, so there is a challenge and, and, may, and, and now at the Brigham, we have done exactly what you uh, have just suggested. So we have increased the curriculum of heart failure for the uh, uh, core cardiology fellows. And our hope in doing that, we have actually quadrupled the curriculum requirements internally for training in advanced heart failure for the core cardiology fellows. And the whole idea is to get them into the excitement for the field earlier rather than later, which is essentially what you were saying is train them uh, to be heart failure docs first and then uh, proceduralists second. Maybe that's another solution worth uh, thinking about. They're gonna hate it though, and they're going to hate you, you know, for saying that. No, I think, but uh, um, uh, Mandeep, the, uh, I'm not saying that you keep the three years the same way, but the way we want to structure the training, uh, we have to be practical. Front loaded, what front loaded. Is, is the first and two years we, we are training for, for procedures, which is okay, which is very exciting. Yeah. But but they're not necessarily great. We not we may not be the greatest of uh, people to be managing patients, right? Yeah. Uh, when we go out into the community, uh, the realities are completely different because the patients come first, right? Yeah. Uh, procedures come later on, so that's unfortunately the truth. But we don't train them that way. Yeah. Um, and so that was my first. Uh, uh, and and per perhaps there is a happy medium here. We could combine imaging with uh, uh, heart failure and you know, yeah, you're, you're well, saying something. Well, no, at the Brigham, uh, Partho, for example, I'll just tell you, you know, um, our fellows themselves wanted more training in heart failure because when they rotate on the CCU side, they're saying the CCU rotation is really an acute heart failure training. <laughs> and we don't know what the hell is happening to these patients outside. Plus, plus they're very, very interested in adult congenital heart disease, cardio-oncology, amyloidosis, infiltrative, uh, you know, other infiltrative inflammatory heart diseases. And uh, so, so you start to look at that, this field is becoming a lot more appetizing and a lot more general uh, for our fellows in general training. So what you're saying is something that has to be taken up by our societies at ACC, et cetera. And to think about um, uh, what you're saying in, in great depth, because you're abso 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 absolutely correct. <laughs> yes, so I think uh, we'll work through that. Then the second question, you know, I'm really um, intrigued uh, what, with your comments about the RV. Uh, and, and I have not worked a lot on RV, but I did some work on RV. I'm not sure if I ever shared with you and I'm gonna put this for the entire panel. What I found, and this is a work with actually Dr. Ehe Maria Kabu, who's in the uh, uh, faculty staff here right now, he was a resident at Mount Sinai. We found that if you look into uh, different predictors of RV failure in people who are receiving LVAD, uh, it was the pulsatility of the septum. And the way we uh, uh, characterized it was, it's a very, uh, on another way, I, we looked at the sphericity, the way it bulges into the RV uh, in systole and then goes in backs and this. And we found this and we have not subsequently published, maybe we need some databases and we can do it together in multicenter if necessary. But this, uh, this pulsatility was a predictor. And from that, I went back and created a theory and I'll be happy to uh, share that, is, is that there's a lot about the geometry of the LV that contributes to the, uh, to the RV. And the entire area of the septum, Mandeep, where this pulsatility develops is, a, is an area where there's a vortex. Uh, the blood flow comes in and generates a circulating current 
and it stays active. Uh, and the way this activity contributes to the RV, and RV is a straightforward flow. There is no vortex. So there's a design to take the energy from the LV into the RV. We completely impede that. Yes. Uh, and, and maybe that there is an ability to, and I'll be happy to look into, but I'm not sure. So I'm when, when someone asks me to look into an LVAD case or um, and, and nothing else on the RV can predict. I can tell you, it's not the strain, it's not the tapsy. It's this one comes up, stands out very, very prominent. And I always look for that that component. And uh, not sure any comments about that. Well, I'll just start quickly and then ask Deepa and Hero to comment as well. But 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 you're absolutely correct. And I think uh, if if you clearly heard me, I was focusing uh, everyone's attention on the importance of the septum and the fact that that we completely take the septum out of the configuration of RV adaptability. And when you, with an LVAD, and, and, and maybe we are overdosing and maybe what one thing, uh, Partho, overdose, you know, there must be, there may actually be okay. such a thing as an overdose of the R LVAD. And, and mm -hmm. what you could help with is that if, if you could figure out a way to look at these septal dynamics better, um, right now, all we say is, is the septum bowing to the right? Is the septum bowing to the left? Is, is it in the middle? And, and we don't actually look at its, um, its function. Um, we look at its position, but not its function. And I think that if you can actually help us reduce the degree of mechanical dysynchrony of the septum vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, without compromising, of course, the needs of the left ventricular flow. You know, how do we actually balance that? That could be a huge advance in the field, as far as I'm concerned. Instead of doing these, well, I, I was about to say, uh, say, say, uh, not so useful um, um, uh, ramp studies. Uh, you know, where we just sit there and look at the position moving from here to there. Um, we should probably be doing uh, a lot more with understanding septal dynamics um, uh, much better. Because what happens, uh, uh, Partho, as you, you you're well aware, in the old days there have been studies where the free wall of the RV has been completely removed, yes. and yet, yet with a Millar catheter. Yeah. Uh, depending on LV dynamics, if you can uh, raise LV pressure and invoke the Starling uh, or invoke the the um, um, the uh, ANREP phenomenon adequately yeah. enough, you know, by by creating the ANREP uh, uh, physiologic phenomenon, you'll you'll restore that pulsatility to the uh, septum, and in fact, you can replicate an RV waveform even without a non-functioning RV free wall. What happens with an LVAD is we take the septum completely away. So then the RV free wall, which is already struggling and dilated and, and hitting its compliance point with the uh, pericardium, now has to start to actually donate some of its work. Um, and so that's why this RVs tend to fail uh, significantly. So I think you're very right, but we need a genius uh, imager like you to help us actually get smart about uh, septal function. And, and we can do a lot with that. We have the tools and there's also all this AI techniques that can help us tease this yep. out. Maybe this is something we should do all together. Sure. Um, any, 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 any other comments, Deepa or Hiro? You have. I, I agree with Dr. Mehra. I think we have learned, uh, you know, optimization of the interventricular septum. We look at position, we look at RV geometry, but we do not look at the septal, um, uh, you know, dynamics in terms of work. I mean, we have done both uh, optimization with hemodynamics as well as with echo, but we have really not looked at underlying septal function, which is definitely an avenue for research. Looking forward to do this together. So anyway, so that's uh, energizing enough for me uh, as a thought so, uh, that allows us to collaborate uh, and uh, continue this dialogue. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Mandeep. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Hiro. And with that, we will conclude and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Thank you so much. I'm so privileged to have had a chance to uh, we'll meet back. up with you we'll all and speak. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.